Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Um, I'm going to be burbling away for a couple of minutes because we know we've got a lot of people who have um, registered. And so we are going to run the poll um, while you're coming in so that you can all have a little look at it um, and make your decisions. So what do you think, if any, would improve family-friendly working within your organization? Um, so a cultural shift, creating a fairer working environment, more positive role modeling, better understanding across the organization, better policies and provisions, and an increase in workshops and training. Um, and we will, I'll let you know what that um, result is um, as we get into the day. I'm just going to watch the number of participants pop up. Um, and then when I think we are close to um, the number that we're expecting to join, um, then I will um, we'll end the poll so that we've then got the response um, and we know what is the most important thing to you. Um, and then we will move into the webinar. Um, and of course, as everybody knows, this is how well supported your site-based staff are and how embedded family-friendly working is across your workplace. Um, we'll have a look at the results in a moment. Um, just to let everybody know, we are recording this session today uh, so that anyone who can't join us will be able to catch up later. Um, possibly with a cup of tea, their feet on the sofa, a cup of coffee, a nice little blanket. It's very chilly today here. Um, or even perhaps with something slightly stronger in the evening. Um, and we've got uh, closed captioning as well. So um, that's available for those people who, who want it. So I think probably one more minute. Um, so what do you think would improve family friendly working within your organization? It's a single choice. Um, and I think we are going to close the poll. It's now 11.03. So, Diana, would you like to close the poll? And we'll see what the response is. And she's going to share the results. Right, OK. Creating a fairer working environment, that's fascinating, is the most popular. Um, then followed by an increase in workshops and training. Working families, big fan of training. Um, and then a cultural shift, more positive role modeling, better understanding. And uh, better policies, interestingly, are the are the least is the, the thing that you think is going to make the least difference. Okay, I think we can stop sharing that now. Um, and uh, so I am taking that off the screen. So welcome everybody. I'm Jane from Sale. I'm the chief exec here at Working Families, um, and we are delighted to welcome you to our Working Families webinar, supporting families in site based sectors which we produced in partnership with our friends at Centrica. Thank you very much indeed, Centrica. So a little bit about Working Families. We are the UK's national charity for working parents and carers. Our mission is to remove the barriers that people with, working, that people with caring responsibilities face at the workplace. And we do this in three key ways, by empowering working parents and carers through our free legal advice service, by supporting employers to improve their flexible and family-friendly practices, and by driving legislative change by influencing policymakers. So our recent 2022 National Work Life Week research showed us that over half of parents and carers in the UK work in site-based roles. That's over half work in site-based roles. And those are roles which must be done at a specific location. This is a staggering number of employees we then ran a survey of site-based organizations and found that 81% of staff feel they need a cultural shift in order to improve flexible working within their organization. So interesting that it was different on the poll um, than our survey. Um, it's clear that finding sustainable solutions for family-friendly working requires, think requires thinking far beyond home and hybrid working if employers are to help all their employees thrive. We're thrilled, I'm particularly thrilled, 
to welcome our inspirational panel here today, who've been blazing the trail for cre creating cultures that support everyone, regardless of their role. Our panelists will be discussing how they've been trialing flexible working and their learning from these experiences, and as well as, as, well as sharing any, about, any barriers that they've had to overcome along the way. And our speakers today are Devi Verdi, the Group Head of Diversity and Inclusion for Centrica, and thanks again, Centrica. Um, then Linda Thwaite, who's the Group Director, Brand, Communications and Impact for Sir Robert McAlpine Limited. And finally, Fleur Cox, who is the co-chair of the Family and Carers Alliance for Rolls-Royce PLC. Um, and I'm also completely delighted to be joined by our moderator, Elliot Ray, who is a best-selling author, a BBC documentary maker, and the founder and editor-in-chief of the Music Football Fatherhood website, which the BBC has rebranded the dad's version of Mum's Net. Um, Elliot's been bringing issues around equal parenting and work-life balance to the mainstream and starting important conversations within organisations that have many site-based staff, helping these employers build transparency, understanding and support around family-friendly and flexible working. We'll shortly be joined, jumping into the panel discussion, but just as a piece of general housekeeping, if you do have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. And once the panel have all spoken, Elliot will get to as many questions as he can in the second half of the webinar. So I'd like to hand over now to Devi at Centrica, our partner for this event, who'd like to say a few words about why they wanted to support this event and the issues that we are discussing today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, Jane, thank you so much for uh, the warm welcome. My name is Debbie Verdi, and I'm the Group Head of Diversity Inclusion at Centrica. So this topic is incredibly important to us. So it's we're really delighted that we've had the opportunity to sponsor the session. Um, a little bit about who we are. So Centrica, we are a multinational energy and utility provider. We're the parent company of British Gas in the UK and Board Gosh in Ireland. So this topic, I would say, is also incredibly timely um, because the world of work has changed significantly you know, over the past 24 months. Most organizations have evolved their ways of working literally overnight. And actually, the future of work is here. I truly believe that. Our sector and actually indeed our organization at Centrica, it's fairly male dominated. And I think there's no hiding away from that. Um, and actually whilst times have changed, what I would say is the world has moved on and this topic is important to us. So it leans into why having a culture shift is, is key to supporting the new ways of working for those family friendly environments. And actually it's important for organization like ours to support parents carers to really thrive in the workplace because this is how we unleash new talent and actually retain talent and one key aspect of that is actually what I would say is what we've seen at Centrica is where actually technology has been a huge enabler for that part so Jane I'm really looking forward to the conversation um, thank you so much. It's always somebody who doesn't press the unmute button, and frequently that person is me. So thanks very much indeed for that, Debbie. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Elliot, who has some questions for the panel. Thank you, Elliot, and over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Jane, and, and welcome, everybody. I want to say five, five or six years ago, I, I was in a, a flexible working panel with HR leaders and, and researchers. And it was a great event. We were talking about flexible working and, and good practice, and we thought we were doing a great job. And then someone in the audience asked a question about how do we make this work for people in customer uh, facing roles and site-based roles. And the people in the panel, we looked at each other and we realized we didn't actually have any concrete things to share around that. You know, five or six years ago, and I'm glad, really glad to say we've moved on quite long from there and things have changed now. We have some good practice and we're going to share some of that today. So my work is around fatherhood, mental health and masculinity. I do that through my organization, Music Football Fatherhood. It's all about culture change and open conversations. We do that through community and content. We actually had an event at Arsenal on Sunday. I'm a QPR fan myself for Arsenal top of the league, so it's really good to work with them. 
As Jane said, I do work around writing and presenting uh, around the BBC and other media outlets as well. I'm also the founder of the Working Dads Employer Awards, which celebrates employers that are doing great work to support working dads. And I fully believe that at the heart of any transformation and to successfully implement any policy, it really starts with culture change. It starts with conversation, with role modeling, with sharing stories and creating safe spaces for parents to come together and share the challenges and the ups and downs of parenting and work-life balance. So I'm so glad that we have three um, very expert, excellent panel members here that are gonna share some of their insights. And they're gonna talk for 10 minutes each around the progress they have made in their organizations in developing a family-friendly working culture that supports working parents and carers, and hopefully sharing some of their insights and initiatives. They're gonna talk about the barriers to creating a flexible and family-friendly organization, and also some top tips what have they seen that has really worked? And for all you listening today, what can you learn and what the actionable takeaways that you can go and do in your organizations as well? So we're going to welcome Debbie to the stage for us to share with us. Debbie from Centrica, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Elliot. So um, I've got 10 minutes, <laughs> 10 minutes. Um, I will do my best to keep to timekeeping and I know you will definitely come in if I'm going over time. So I think just to sort of start off, um, you know, the, the first question really is, so what progress, you know, have we made in our organization in terms of developing a family friendly working culture that sort of supports parents, carers, particularly for those on, you know, the work in in site-based roles. Um, and I'd love to share sort of two examples of, of some of the initiatives that we've actually launched. And I think the question itself is great. I think the first thing is to say is, what's really interesting is there's a commonly held belief, right? That actually career success and a happy family life don't come hand in hand. And the reality of that you've got a prosper in business, people have to sacrifice evenings with family, you know, the, the, the dropping of domestic responsibilities. And, and so on goes that narrative, right? And actually, that is still heavily prevalent narrative within the corporate world. But the reality is, you know, times have changed, right? And this doesn't have to be the case. If I think about some of the initiatives that we've done at Centrica to really sort of support colleagues, it's very much about, you know, that, that culture piece of building a, a family-friendly working environment and how it's actually benefited us as an organization. For one thing, actually respecting and actually supporting our colleagues' rights to spend time with their families it's a huge retention tool for us. And actually we've, we've identified in our own data that it's actually helped our colleagues become more engaged and more productive. So one of the things that we did you know, 18 months ago um, as, a, as a key initiative with the way the world was moving post COVID, we basically brought about and introduced what we called our flexible first approach. This was back in 2021 in the summer. What does it mean? It literally means what it says on the tin. Um, we did a survey amongst all our colleagues, right, in our customer fulfillment centers, as well as those in our sort of professional service functions to really understand what they wanted. We jointly worked with our carers network, as well with our working parents network, who are our employer resource groups, to just understand, you know, what our colleagues wanted. Um, we listened to them and then we presented back this, this approach, which simply means, you know, for colleagues regardless of where you are, it's about you have the flexibility to work, whether that's from home or in the office or a mix. And actually overnight, our organization pivoted, right? And that value, that, that trust, that recognition piece to, to provide that opportunity of flexibility and that support, and those with caring responsibilities has been a huge step change for our organization. So that's the first thing that we did. The second thing that we've done actually is this year um, was really specific for our customer fulfillment teams. You know, we wanted to be, we had an ambition to really move into a more sort of modern day contact center. And we actually introduced what we call choice hours. Um, choice hours is the, is the term that we use internally. We piloted this across last year, actually within the UK, um, actually up in Scotland. And we rolled this out in Q2 this year. We were told consistently through feedback and through our own engagement surveys, you know, that our people wanted, particularly those on those on-site roles, they wanted more flexibility around where they worked, 
um, you know, and when they worked. So that the where and the when piece was really clear, but it was also clear from the volume of our flexible working requests that came through this particular audience that the shift was actually about, you know, the current shift patterns they weren't working for our solvers. That's the term that we use internally in our organization. And actually a fundamental objective for us was actually about increasing engagement within that on-site role population in our customer fulfillment teams. And so we knew that we had to be just bold and actually deliver flexibility for our people. So as of October, so we launched this in Q2, as of October, we now have within basically up and down the UK, we've launched our choice hours approach. The feedback actually has been extremely positive. Um, we focused on engagement with our, actually our customers sentiments have been running through this in, in terms of the heart of thinking. And actually, you know, what choice hours has actually delivered, it's an improvement in the distribution of our people across the day. So, you know, whilst we realize that, um, some areas we didn't see significant improvements actually in our answer rates right so our customer fulfillment teams are those teams who are basically our contact center teams um, and what was really interesting was that whilst we whilst we may not have seen significant improvement in answer rates right we clearly saw an increase in terms of staffing levels mornings and evenings because that's when our customers were calling us so choice hours has now actually become what I would deem as a, a business as usual activity. Um, what was the art of the impossible is the art of the possible for us. Um, and what's really interesting is now we've got over 55% of our people, they've chosen to work a four day week or a four and a half day week pattern versus a five day week. So that's really absolutely sort of provided and upskilled, you know, and supported our, our sort of our colleagues. But actually, I think you might be wondering, how does this impact our customers? It's for the better, right? Because we, we also acknowledge that we're able to, to actually deliver more acceptable answer rates. And we know that the current recruitment drive, right? We know that we also have to support to recruit to improve this. Um, so they're just, just the two sort of initiatives that I wanted to share up front. And I'd say, you know, what are the barriers, right? In terms of really em embedding that sort of flexible family, you know, um, approach and, and culture. The challenge is getting that balance right. Um, you know, if I'm going to be really honest, I think, I think it's about making sure for us it was about obtaining the business needs. So that triangle for us is the business, the customer, and the colleague, and really making sure that there's no disconnect between the two. You know, the reality is, whilst our organization is heavily male dominated, actually our on site roles, our customer fulfillment roles on the flip side are heavily female orientated. So, you know, if I was giving you some statistics, you know, at Centrica, overall representation of females is at 29%. If I think about our leadership population, that's at 33%. So, we're actually not in too much of a, you know, we're in a very progressive space, I'd say, when I look at the sector as a whole. But if I'm thinking about on site roles specifically, and this is not your traditional engineering, you're talking about your customer service agents, 80% of that is at females. If I'm looking at our engineering roles, it's the flip. 96% of those roles are, are male dominated, you know, um, our engineers who are going in and knocking on our customers' doors, you know, helping fix their boilers, service and repair their boilers. So really, really different. And I think that challenge about getting it right um, is really key. And I think finally, just to add, um, you know, we've got to recognize that actually the, the, the enablement piece and, and providing that sort of flexibility also allows women to continue their careers, right? Um, and and for those who have caring responsibilities um, and actually enables more men in our organization, what we've seen to also co-actively sort of, you know, co-actively co-parent. I, I say co-actively because it's a dual piece, right? Um, and we've seen this also, you know, when we look at our, our parental leave uh, requests that are coming in. So I think the, the role modeling piece from senior leaders for us as a this year has been a significant step change. We had one of our most senior leaders in, um, in our British Gas leadership team take extended parental leave. Again, it was really about demonstrating that role modeling piece to show that, you know, there are some jobs that can be done from home and actually senior leaders do need to set the tone. Um, so 
I think just to sort of finish on that, um, really for me, Elliot, it's, it's, you know, if I'm talking about what practical steps could organizations take and that, that final question to really create a more supportive and inclusive family friendly environment, I think if you're starting right at the, the foundational level, um, I think you've got to look at your culture, right? What is it that you're looking to achieve as an organization? I think definitely there's an opportunity to look at, you know, establishing focus groups, focus groups, whether that is a setup of a parents network or a carers network, because it's an enablement of a resource. So it allows, you know, colleagues, employees to really share, support each other. And it encourages, you know, those with caring responsibilities to come together because it, it allows then, you know, the organization just to have a better understanding of actually what do your people want? Um, and what do your people want from on-site roles? And I think for us, the choice of hours piece, whilst we had the flexible first working approach, it wasn't enough for those on on-site roles. So that was something that for us was absolutely key in terms of the engagement piece, because we knew we needed to make a step change. That's brilliant, Debbie. Thank you so much. And I completely agree that the power of networks, the power yeah. of bringing people together and hearing their voices is key. And I really like what you said there about the choice hours, not only how it's worked for your staff, but actually how it's worked for your customers as well. Um, and that, that is really important. There's also questions coming through for you. Uh, so at the Q&A part, we'll, we'll get to those questions. So thank you so much. Drop more questions in the Q&A box. We'll come to as many as we can. Thank you, Debbie. OK, thank now you. I'd like to introduce Linda to the stage, Group Director of Brand Communications and Impact for Sir Robert McAlpine Limited. Linda, over to you. Oh, thanks, Elliot. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, thanks for everyone to taking time to come and listen to us today. I hope that what we say is, is helpful, that the questions do offer you an opportunity to really ask some meaningful questions that you can go back and implement. And I've seen that that's already happening. So um, just to introduce myself, I'm the Group Brand Impact, uh, Communications and Impact Director at Sir Robert McAlpine. Sir Robert McAlpine are family-owned builders. We're 153 years old very traditionally male organisation, as you might imagine, and we build some of the UK's most iconic buildings. So um, we've just finished work on Elizabeth Tower, better known as Big Ben. We built the Olympic Stadium. So that's the, the type of work that we do. There are over 2,000 team members in the business. As I said, the majority of those are male. And again, the majority of those are out on site or working on building projects. So our workforce isn't people like me really sat behind desks. Very few of us are sat like this. The majority of people are out there and need to be out on site. Um, so I want to tell you a bit of a, a story about how we got involved in flexible working today, if that was possible, um, and why it matters to us so much. And also just be really honest about the journey that we're on, because not to sound like I'm on X Factor, we are on a journey. and um, We are by no means at the end of it. We haven't got all the answers yet, but um, I think only by being really honest and authentic about the challenges that we're finding compared to what we want to be is the only way we're all going to get better, really. So um, flexible working matters to us for um, a couple of reasons. The first is mental health. It's a really sobering um, conversation to have and, and not the most upbeat. I, I, I take that. But um, male suicide rates in the UK are horrific. Unfortunately, the majority of male suicides are men who work in construction. Now, if you are at all empathetic and you work in construction and you know that statistic, you can't just know that and do nothing about it. So um, we have to look at why is this happening? Why are so many men in the UK struggling with their mental health? Why are so many choosing to take their own life? And why are so many of those in construction? You can't do nothing about that. The second big driver um, comes from something from me personally. I'm, I'm a, a senior female executive and I was for a very long period of time a single mom. Um, and I know for a fact there is no way I would have this job if it hadn't been for the fact that each of my leaders has allowed me to have enormous flexibility. It doesn't mean I work any less hard, but it does mean that over the past 15 years I have worked in really non-traditional patterns and ways. I've done more calls on um, grass verges than probably anyone has ever done in, in conference rooms, things like that. So I knew that flexibility was key to helping gender equality in the workplace too. So those two reasons have really driven um, 
why we've got so involved and we are involved right from the top to the bottom so our chief executive is a huge champion for flexible working and um, just before the pandemic hit I was sat outside um, a dance class for my daughter and I just kind of rushed there rushed them in ran back to the car opened my laptop on my knee ready to look all professional and do a conference call did the conference call and then decided to have a little look at Instagram to cheer myself up um, I came across Mother Pucker, who I followed, Anna Whitehouse, you may know of her, and she does something called Flex Appeal. And she posted asking businesses, can anyone help? We need to move this movement forward. Is there anyone out there with a budget, with a business that can help? And I honestly just sat there thinking, yeah, I can help. I'm going to do this. I can help. And I emailed her and I said yes. And from there, we started collaborating together. That led to us um, commissioning a piece of research during the pandemic called Forever Flex Report. And that looked at taking flexible working beyond a crisis, so beyond the pandemic. And we interviewed you know, 1,500 people, a number of businesses and sectors to really find out how you make true flex work. And there's loads of advice and practical um, stories that you, can, that you can use in that report. And I'll make sure that it's shared with you afterwards. Um, but that, that was really useful and it, it really helped and we were trying to campaign internally and change my business at the same time as campaign externally for everybody else. But lots of the um, barriers that I was coming up against were, well, that all sounds lovely, Linda, but, you know, where are the stats? What's the facts? What's the financial implication? So we were like, right, OK, you want that? Let's go and get it. So we worked again with Mother Pucker and um, a think tank called Pragmatics. And we did a report called Flexonomics, which looked at the um, financial implications and the economic case for flexible working. Again, I'll share that one with you if, if it's of interest. There's lots of graphs and facts and stats in there. But basically, it said that um, flexible working was worth £37 billion pounds to the UK economy and that an increase in 50% would unlock £55 billion pounds worth of value for the UK economy. Now, our economy is in a an interesting state, shall we say, at the moment. So anything that can unlock value and be of benefit is a good thing. So we did these reports and we did this research and that's all part of our campaign to help the UK become more flexible. But internally, we had a dual track of trying to make ourselves more flexible at the same time. So as I said before, we are majoritively site-based. So working with TimeWise, we launched two pilots, two sites. So to give you some context, we've got around 55 to 60 projects or sites working across the UK at any time. And we just took two of them, one in the north, one in the south. And we spoke to them to say, right, we're gonna shift your site to flexible working. Let's work to figure out how we do that. And both sites took a very different approach and it was based on the engagement upfront with them to figure out what flexible meant to them and how it was going to work. The first step, I should say, a part of that engagement was that nobody really knew what flexible working was. They all thought we'd come to talk to them about working from home, which when you have to be on site for a concrete pour at eight in the morning is completely impossible. So there was a lot of education, a lot of conversations around what flexible working and agile working really means, working patterns, different hours, you know, all of those different options. And both sites came up with their own solution as a team that they thought would work for them. Now, the end report for that is due in January, but we had an interim um, feedback session with them actually just the other week and um, it was phenomenal. So the project manager himself said, I was really resistant to this, but I honestly believe we can never go back. And I was like, just, just say that again. So I don't think we could ever go back because productivity is the same. People that are working there, allotted hours but the productivity is the same whereas before they'd be working long extended hours be a lot more stressed um, and the productivity would be the same so in essence we're getting more done in less time he said but the biggest thing is the stories that people are just happier they're just they're just in a better mood some of the stories were brilliant we've got grandparents who now leave on an allotted time once every two weeks because they've got caring duties We've got, you know, parents who can adapt to their own duties. We've got one guy who fed back that actually it's really helped his marriage because now he has more time. They set up a date night and on the day that he finishes early, he goes, he takes his wife on a date and it's just really helped their marriage. So it doesn't have to be huge, you know, changing the whole country things to show the benefit. It's just 
that people are getting a better deal. So that's two sites out of 55 to 60 sites. We have got a long way to go, a lot of lessons to learn, a lot of barriers to overcome, which are around training and um, misconceptions, but we are on that journey and we are dedicated to it because if it leads to more women being able to move up through the ranks like me, then we will have succeeded. And if it means that the men who work in our business have a better work-life balance and therefore their mental health improves and we can lower that suicide rate, then happy days. Great. Thank you, Linda. And I think um I think the points you've made there about why this work is so important and the human element to this is is so key. You know, you spoke about mental health and suicide and family and relationships. You know, the work we are doing to implement flexible working for everyone is make, really having a positive impact on people's lives. So thank you for really just centering us and, and talking about why, why this work is so important. Okay, questions in the Q&A box. Lots of questions coming in. Please do continue to put those in and we'll get to those in around 10 minutes. Um, so Fleur, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I'm probably going to echo some of the, the points that uh, Debbie and, and Linda have raised. Um, so a little bit about me, a little about Rolls Royce. So um, many people might have come to this uh, webinar thinking that we make cars. We don't. We're a power generation company. That's Rolls Royce Motor Cars. Um, so we are a power generation company. We have 44,000 employees in 49 countries, incredibly global. Um, we make all kinds of industrial power from jet engines that power your flights across the Atlantic through to defense products, um, those that support uh, power stations. And then the part of the organization that I sit in, which is part of our net zero journey, looking at fully electric and hybrid electric flight. So a really broad company and um, a bit like uh, both Debbie and Linda said, we are um, a male dominated company. We're around 10 to 12 percent female. There are pockets of difference across the group. Um, my role um, as a co-chair of an employee resource group um, that's essentially my side hustle. So I work in Roswell's Electrical. I have a, again, I have a senior exec position in, in that part of the business. But around four years ago, after I came back off my first maternity leave, um, I took on the co-chair position of the Family and Carers Alliance. Um, we have a really clear mission and purpose. We're all volunteers. We have a small committee. But it's around making Rolls Royce um, the best place it can be to work for those that have any family or caring responsibilities. And that's regardless of how your family's made up. We want to see every, you know, every smorgasbord of family life there is. Um, we offer a safe space so anyone can come to talk to us about any issue. We also act as a conduit between um, HR, employee relations and the company. We act as a voice of the employee. We get invited to things like meet the board events. So we get the ability to really share what our employees are saying around family and caring life. Um, so I think I'll echo some of, of, of what Linda and Debbie have said around, this isn't just about um, something that the kind of pandemic forced us to think about in terms of where we work. In the UK, we have 20,000 employees. And of those, around 50% um, are site-based. Now, these are really highly skilled roles. So you can't make a jet engine from your dining table. So it's roles that we do need to have people working shifts. It's a 24-hour operation. It's an incredibly high-value operation as well. I say incredibly technically skilled. So for us where we've started our journey and the role of our ERG as well. We start our journey um, really this year, uh, there's been a real focus on family friendly policies. So we see this as a non-negotiable. This is, this is ourselves in the employee resource group, working with employee relations, working with HR to say, let's look at all the policies that may affect any of our employees when it comes to family and caring life make sure they are up to date they are easy to interpret they are easy to find and also that managers and line managers and leadership are aware of how to deploy 
those policies because it may be in a line manager's career they only ha- ever have one employee that comes to them and asks around shared parental leave or flexible working so that for us was an absolute baseline and we are really conscious that we do have roles that we would struggle for somebody to do in a truly flexible way for example I'm working off my dining table today and I have ultimate flexibility we do need people to be on site so it then goes into a how do we support those employees that are on site so we have gone on a cultural journey over a number of years a bit like Linda was saying We're a really old company. We're over 100 years old. We're very traditional in a lot of ways. But we've tried to bring ourselves culturally into the 21st century. And we've put a real focus on human-centric leadership. So this is about managers and leaderships, seeing their teams and seeing their employees as a rounded, full person that is not just the person that comes to work, that there are other elements to people's lives. So we've done some work with a company called TLC Lions. They've done loads of activities with with senior leadership and leadership looking at how do we manage teams in this environment that does promote well-being, that does promote a culture of openness, that does promote a culture of asking for the support they need to be able to fulfil the rest of the life they have outside of Rolls-Royce. That's been really, really successful. And we are actually seeing some more examples, especially around dads. So especially around dads in our business, being open um, sharing those stories of what it means to be a parent in the workplace. We're also seeing an uptake on um, parental leave in terms of shared parental leave, in terms of paternity leave. Um, we as an employee resource group really promote those stories as well so we have a conference as an ERG next year and we are going to have a dad forum and it is all about sharing those it's a it's a mini panel it's talk about those stories but it's also getting leadership into those stories to say why they support it it might not be something they do themselves but why do they support our teams working flexibly we also have a being program and this is this is a global program where again it's all around the human element of our employees and our employee experience around bringing your full self to work and this goes across all of inclusion all of diversity but is really pertinent to, to flexible working so i think the key takeaways from in terms of what we're doing as, as an organization is one, we accept that we have challenges around site-based roles. And I've today I've given a really UK-centric story. We are a global organization. We as an ERG are conscious that we need to be able to reach all of our employees, not just those in the UK. And there is a nuance around shop floor based staff where they may not have access to a laptop in the same way that we do so how do we reach that that part of the organization so we've put the baseline of family friendly policies we're creating an open culture around talking around flexible working and the erg is really embedded in in the organization in terms of talking to the real senior parts of our organization around what it means to work flexibly within the company um, And I just wanted to reiterate the the stories that that Linda said about having that positive feedback, because I think as we've seen a cultural shift, we are definitely seeing more positive stories. And when we as an ERG have run events, we've had people come to us afterwards saying, you've really opened my eyes to what's available to me, because I think sometimes that's that's half the battle is making sure that all of our employees know what they're entitled to, what's available to them. And the fact that we will as a company always endeavor to show the best support for our employees. Thank you, Fleur, thank you so much. I think think what you're talking there in terms of creating the safe spaces and 
and the culture change is really at the heart of, of what we're talking about here you know when it comes to the fatherhood work i've had dad say to me that um you know instead of putting in their diary that they're leaving to do the school pickup they will keep their their jacket behind their chair to make it look like they're still at work or they'll put a meeting in their diary instead of actually just saying i'm going to do the school run i think the culture change here is is at the heart and that poll we did at the beginning really showed that a lot of us um here today attending really felt like that culture change is one of the most important things that we can do so thank you so much Fleur so Debbie Linda please also put your cameras on and Fleur come back put your camera on uh we're going to come back to the panel discussion we've got loads of questions for you as well and um Debbie I'm going to start with you because we had loads of questions about the choice hours it seems like everyone's really interested in that it's a great initiative can you say more about the detail so is it complete choice can people choose and also, how do you ensure that the hours are also covered to support the business requirements as well? Yeah, no, great questions um, coming through. I did have a look, um, Elliot. So I think I'm going to try and cover off most of the questions in, in this piece here. So um, I think really important. So starting point, what was our ambition? Our ambition was about delivering a modern day contact center, right? So we were consistently really told through our feedback from our colleagues, through our engagement surveys, that actually our teams, our on-site teams, they wanted more flexibility around where they worked and when they worked. So these two pieces here. It was actually also really clear to us, actually from the volume of the flexible working requests that we were getting, and um, the shift slide request that actually we received the current shift patterns, they just weren't working for those individuals, right? So for that group of individuals. And on top of that, one of the things we were looking to do was actually drive engagement. So going back to what both, you know, Fleur, Lynn, what, what everyone has been saying, we were really looking at how do we get just better engagement from our people, right? Because we know, and there's enough data out there to say, when you're, when, colleagues are more engaged there is less, less absenteeism right they thrive better at work they're more productive etc cetera, etc cetera. so we were looking really to push that you know by sort of 10 points within our own organization and we really felt that actually 2022 was a time to really shift now one of the questions did ask is you know is this strictly for your uh, contact center and are you looking at rolling it out Choice hours is strictly for our contact center on-site roles because we have what we call flexible first. It was one of the very first initiatives I mentioned on the call. That's for everybody. So like me, I have a really great hybrid working opportunity. You know, I am working at home today. Tomorrow I'm going to go into the office. So for professional services, it's very, very different. For on-site customer center are, are those teams. Yes, the hours do have to be covered. So there is a core rotation that actually our teams have. They get to put in their choice hours for the first, second, and third choice. The hours within the teams from basically eight to eight have to be covered. And what is really great that we're actually seeing is actually the employees, they did their own survey and they shaped the design of the shift pattern. So they asked for, you know, certain late shifts across the week. They asked for one in three weekends. They asked for no late working. And some of them even asked for a, a four day working week, right? So this is what our people wanted. And I guess just to share some headline results, in fact, 71% of our colleagues received their first preference. And actually 76% received their second and third choice. So what it shows is, is actually for us is, we've listened to colleagues, Right. We've had to take a bit of a temperature check because we knew that. And when we saw how shift patterns were working before, the opposite was actually happening. So we weren't able to fulfill our calls supporting our customers because we didn't have the staffing level sufficient or correctly. Right. We didn't have the, the sufficient staffing levels across the mornings and the evenings. So what Choice Hours has done, Elliot, it's really delivered an improvement actually in our distribution of people across the day right so and i think that's been fundamental for us you know in terms of how we are supporting our customers in terms of answer rates right and then on the flip side what we've also seen is now you know we've got less absenteeism less sickness you know we've got just more happy and more productive people um and so 
having done the launch in Q2 up in Scotland, Q3 for us is now pretty much most of the UK. One area we are still, which is still to be confirmed is Ireland. So it's when we go out to board Gosh, um, and that's for next year. But I think it's a massive game changer for us um, in our organization. Yeah. Mm, yeah, thanks, David. That's a very comprehensive response. Thank you so much. <laughs> You've done a great job of answering all those questions there. Um, I'm going to move on to, to, to managers now. And I know that any kind of initiative change transformation it's often you know, the middle managers that are the really important people to engage to make sure your policy actually gets through to the people that need it. So how do you go about equipping managers with the skills to manage flexible site-based teams? Um, so Linda, I'll come to you first on this question, please. Yes, Elliot. Um, it's not been easy, um, but it does require training and hand-holding and support, and it will do, I think, until it becomes business as usual. You know, the way we work currently has been it's 150 odd years old. So, you know, everybody's known about it, has learned about it on the way up. And this is a completely different way of doing things. And so it does require training. And at the front end of um, working with people, um, we've had to go through, you know, how might we set out rotors differently? What do we, what list of things do we need to double check? You know, things that won't drop or won't um, be not covered adequately enough. So it is, it does require additional support. And I think that's one of the barriers, Elliot. You know, that's why people are hesitant to do it because it's just easier to carry on the way things have always been. But if we want long-term change, we have to have this momentary shift of trajectory where we put extra effort into making it better for the long term. So we are having to provide training, we are having to provide guidance documents, toolkits, on hand support, making sure that we've got feedback loops and you know that that sounds like a lot of effort but it's it's got to be worth it in the long run hasn't it but it, yeah. effort definitely Flora anything to add does that, does that resonate with your experience as well yeah I I think I think I, I I agree I think for us it's it's definitely having the framework to support managers because it's easier for a manager to have a conversation with their employee if they actually know they've got kind of an HR policy to fall back on. But what we did is we made sure that we didn't just put policies out there, stick them on the internet and get people to find them. There's a how-to guide that goes, so it guides managers through that conversation. And I think the more you see role models as well, I think unlocks so much of this as well. You can't be what you can't see. And we've seen examples, even my own manager approached me last week and said, I wanna talk about flex working and I'm thinking, you, you please don't be questioning my working pattern and it wasn't he'd seen it work so well he wants to do it himself so the more we see that role modeling and the more we enable open conversations it's just a great unlocker for this to work yeah thank you so we're going to move that from managers onto senior leaders now i'm assuming Fleur, debbie linda you're, you're all here um so i'm assuming you you have senior leadership support for, for what you do but we know for many of the attendees here, they may be struggling, you know, chairs of ERGs, HR leaders struggling with really convincing their senior leaders that this is important and getting the sign off for the initiatives they want to take. So is there any advice for you know, how do you go about influencing and persuading senior leadership to actually go ahead and make these these important changes in regards to flexible working? So Debbie, we're really, really interested to hear from, from you first on this. Um, I think it's a great question. I think, you know, a starting point is go and get the data, right? I think go and, you know, and I think data is something that resonates with senior leaders, number one. Um, you know, go and go and understand what is what is your sickness, you know, if it's a team, if it's a department, what is that, you know, that 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 rate in your organization, the retention rate, understand the key data points and share that back with your senior leaders. Go and talk to your networks if you have networks, if you've got focus groups, right? You've got to open up the conversation um, because there's going to be a population in your organization that are clearly asking for this. But I think for me, Elliot, it's the it's the head and the heart approach. You've got to bring the two to the table to a senior leader. It is no good just coming in with your data and then you're not bringing the heart piece to it, right? Um, and for me, that's the best way when you talk about influencing senior stakeholders to, to bring that to the table. And you've got to know what you want. So 
ultimately, what is it that you're asking for? And is it justifiable for your business? So, you know, we're talking about on-site roles today. The reality in, in the organization I work for, this is not going to work for our engineers, right? So our engineers who are every day going in and knocking on customers' doors, you know, to fix their boilers, this choice hours piece or flexible first approach is not for them. I think Kat Fleur also covered that when she talked about, you know, Rolls-Royce and some of the roles it's really important. You've got to know what who this is for and what that population is for and what are you after. after. So I hope mm. that just gives a bit of flavor. So head and heart approach. Yeah, brilliant. And Linda, when you were um, going, working with Mother Parker, you were taking the ideas around to your, your board your board members. How did you get a sign off for that? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably a bit more dramatic. So um, I would um, <laughs> I would tell them about the crisis that is coming and, and paint that picture very, very clearly for them, whether it be around retention, whether it be skill shortage, whether it be what our competitors are up to, you know, sometimes you need to paint the picture very vividly for people to understand how important it is. Um, I then went straight back to our values. One of our values is family as a value. You know, we treat one another like family and I didn't think we potentially always were doing that. Were we really giving people the same amount of consideration as our work family to be able to be in their home family, whatever it may look like. So, and I would also um, say that you have to paint the picture of the crisis that you've potentially headed towards or the alternative, the potential that we could have that solves some of the problems that we've got as a business, but how will it feel when we get there and paint that picture? You know, everyone on the senior leadership team has said, we really rightly said, they're just people. You need to appeal to what would appeal to you appeals to them. So get your data, get your facts, but you know, appeal to appeal to the human in them so that they can see the potential, definitely. And and for some of it, make sure that you think about bite size, not the whole thing. You know, you can't fix everything all in one go. So get some permission to get started. And it's hard to stop you once you're going, isn't it? Thanks, Linda. We're just people, right? Sometimes we look at institutions, yeah. board members, they're just human beings with feelings and families and like, yeah. like everyone else. It's good to remind them of that, you know, sometimes too. So they step out of the management so you can be normal people. That's always a good one, isn't it? Definitely. And um, so Flo, I'm going to change the angle on this question slightly. We had a, a question come in uh, specifically for you. And it was around this, this person is currently championing a family-friendly policy review in their global manufacturing business. And they are represented in ERG and they're asking whether it's, it's, it's good to split that out from their women at Morgan ERG and take it wider. I assuming is it better to make it an issue that's not not for their ERG, that's not just focused on the women in their organisation, but the wider business. Is this something that you have done and what would you be your advice for this person? Yeah, so so the way we approached it is um, each as we come to the close of one year and into the next year, myself and my co-chair will, will sit down and say, what is it we want to achieve within that year? So if we get, to, for example, when we get to the end of 2022, as we're about to review, what does success look like? So we had a whole, um, we had three strands because, and I, I talked about this on a podcast recently, you, you can't do everything. You want to do everything. We also have day jobs as well. As much as I'd love to do inclusion full time, I do have a day job as well. So we had to be something that was achievable. And one of them was around, it started with um, improving parental leave because we'd all had mixed experiences. And out of that, we started talking to employee relations. We started getting a really good relationship with them. And they said, it was actually a bit of an organic conversation that says, actually, we need to do a broad across, across the patch. We need to do a whole um, refresh of all the family friendly policies. So adoption leave, parental leave, shared parental leave. So it started with a really clear objective from us, which is improving parental leave. Actually, we got so much more out of it because these family friendly policies could impact any one of us as an employee. And I think it's also, if we just link it back to a previous question, in terms of senior management, you know, buy off, we have an exec sponsor. So Mark, our exec sponsor, he's the group's legal counsel. He reports into the CEO. So all this work we're doing around family friendly policies, we were constantly feeding back into him. So I think my advice is, if you feel it's something that is really important that the company should be focusing on, 
then do treat it as his own project, but make sure you've got some really, really strong links into HR because ultimately it will become one of their business objectives to deliver. And then you start to kind of close that circle and you will get to the end of the project and go, we've delivered that successfully. And it's embedded in the work that HR have delivered. Thank you. Okay, so there's another question here around, around outcomes. And the question is, have, have the employers seen a change in the gender ratio within roles since introducing more flexible working? So that's open to all. Is it, have any of you had any of those kind of outcomes that you've seen from, from the work that you've done so far? I'll, I'll, should I pick up first? Um, Gender-wise, we don't have stats to show that it's influenced it yet. I think there's probably going to be a longer tail on that. I think um, anecdotally, we're seeing more women enter the construction industry and I'm definitely seeing more women work their way through the ranks. But I think that's from because of a number of actions rather than just more flexibility. But um, I think it will take us a bit longer to find that out, if I'm honest. Yeah. Debbie, Fleur, any, any outcomes that you've seen? Yeah, I, I think I'd agree. I, th I think, I mean, we recently did the Working Families Benchmarking um, and one of the things that actually, uh, one of our pieces of feedback is around data and the richness of the data we're collecting. So I think actually that's influenced us to start looking at what are the influential trends in terms of what the data is telling us and how do we interpret that? So I'd agree with Linda. I think we, we won't see kind of results for a little while. I mean, we have, we, you know, we'll put our hands up and say, we have a messy middle issue around middle management and female talent and talent retention. So there's quite a few things in the mix there in terms of how we interpret our data. Yeah, and I think part of this is trust in the process. You know, we, we know this is the right thing to do. Uh, the results will come. So fundamentally providing flexible working is good for, for gender equality in the workplace, mental health and wellbeing, children, relationships. We know it's the right thing to do. Uh, the data will come when, when we are measuring that over time. OK, so we're coming to the end, but I'm going to ask the panel to give their last wise, profound words. They haven't prepared for this. Um, so I'm going to give you like 20 or 30 seconds. What do you want the, the audience listening to really leave with? What is it that you've heard or you've said that you really want to, to leave the, the audience with? So. Debbie, over to you first. What do I want the audience to leave with? So I think I think society has evolved. Um, and actually with that, I would say caring responsibilities, you know, have evolved, flexible and family working, you know, um, are increasing. It's an increasingly value, right, by employees throughout their careers, whether you're at the start, the middle, or at the top. And so I think if you're if you're dialing into today, you've you've heard us have the conversation. I think take a view as to what is it that your organization needs, right? Again, it's that that hard approach here because um, this isn't something that's going to go away, right? And and I think the future is actually here now. Um, it's here to stay. And I think in, it's about embracing it. And I think the more as organizations you embrace it, you know, the, the more happier your your people are. And ultimately, you know, that's a better and a stronger output to to sort of society as a whole. So that would be my my sort of last piece. Thank you, Debbie. 20 seconds from you, Linda. Okay. Um, flex can absolutely change the way it feels for everyone in work long term, but it takes longer than you think to make it happen. And you will want to give up at some point and think someone else will have to do this. I've run out of energy. Don't. Keep gritty. Keep strong. Keep going. It will come through eventually. And you're on this call, so you've made step one. So good luck with it. And reach out if you need help. Brilliant. Thank you. Fleur? Uh, I think the biggest takeaway is be your own cheer squad, be your own cheer squad and, and continue to champion what it is you're doing, but also see your employees as human beings. We all put our trousers on one leg at a time. So, you know, we all, um, we all have stuff going on outside work. And I think if we start having human interactions, the, the rest will organically come. Brilliant. It's been a pleasure. It's been amazing and um, great insights. I'm gonna hand over to, to Jane for some final words before we close. Thank you so much, everybody. That was completely inspirational, insightful, and hugely generous of you to share your knowledge and experience and, and to say that you know our audience could reach out to you. Amazing questions too. Always good to have an engaged audience. Um, great insights. And Elliot, thanks so much for moderating today. You really do add 
um, lightness and delight <laughs> to these to these sessions. Um, at Working Families, we've been helping employers build flexible, family-friendly workplaces for over 40 years. And Fleur mentioned earlier, um, we have our top, our 2023 top employers benchmark is now open for new members. Um, so we are, for new entries rather, so it's the only UK tool available that measures all aspects of flexible working and work-life policies and practices. Um, so it's only open to Working Families members, so do please get in touch with our em employer services team if you're interested in learning more. Um, for me, I wanted to tell you something exciting that's happening at Working Families this week. As of midday today, so literally now, we've launched a special Christmas appeal with Big Give. For the next seven days, every single donation to Working Families will be doubled at no cost to the donor. Um, if each of our 1.1 million unique viewers of our advice pages gave us a pound, we'd be able to double the support that we provide, well, more than double the support we provide to everybody. Um, so uh, we'd be delighted if you could give a pound, five pounds, whatever is affordable for you. We hope that today's session has given you some useful takeaways to help your site-based staff find a balance that will enable them to thrive at work and at home. For, from the whole team here at Working Families, a thank you for joining us today. Um, given that Christmas is only just around the corner, we wish you an enjoyable festive break when it comes. Thank you, everybody. This has been an amazing session. Thank you. Bye.